Huge warm uh, applause for Chef Murad. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, first of all, before we start, thank you for having me again. Um, it's always nice to come here and make the drive and, and, and see the beautiful campus and the beautiful people here. Um, how many Moroccan people are in here? None. So this is so awesome because I can say whatever the fuck I want to say. Nobody, <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody's going to like hold me accountable. Um, no. Um, but before we start, Marty is one of my best friends and I've known him for a long time and he works at Google. So I've been getting the insights on what goes on on the campus and, and um, you know, how life is for a chef on, on the campus as opposed to the restaurant you know, world. Um, he's been with me on Iron Chef. He's been with me when I wrote the book. He was very instrumental in, in recipe development and recipe testing. So thank you, Marty, and it's so fitting that you're here today. Um, and also, I want to give thanks to Chef Damari. He's the uh, fellow in the back. Um, he was responsible for putting this whole demo together and all the ingredients, and he did a great job. Um, so thank you, Mari. Um, good morning. So to start off, um, I just want to talk a little bit about Moroccan food. Um, when, when I was growing up, I had no intention of becoming a cook or a chef. Um, I had no idea how to cook, um, and I grew up in a regular family, you know, traditional family with a lot of people living in the same house. Uh, we were, I think, 12 or 13 people. Um, and basically, the women did all the cooking, the men did all the talking. Uh, and it seems like it worked for a while, but when I came here, it turned out that there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of reasons why that was going on. And, and, and I start to understand the, the importance of food um, to these women that I grew up watching cooking. Um, uh, my parents got divorced and my mom was um, living with my grandpa, so she spent a lot of time in the kitchen. And she did a lot of cooking and I felt really bad for her growing up, so I spent a lot of time sitting next to her but I had absolutely no desire to cook, or I never understood the importance of what she was doing um, to my family. I, I grew up in one of the most dysfunctional families, um, but it was the food that actually made us stick together. It was the glue that made everybody in that family, no matter how much they hated each other, come together to the same table, the same round table, every day, three times a day, and that was the best therapy that we could have asked for. Um, uh, but when I came to the States, um, I came here to become an economist and work for a bank and make a lot of money and go back home and support everybody, but <laughs> that didn't pan out. Um, so uh, when I came here, I was really homesick. And I started calling my family almost on a daily basis until that one day, a few weeks later, when I, um, when I got the phone bill from AT&T and it was so, you know, humongous. I was like, fuck this shit, I'm not going to call them every day. So I had to come up with a better way of connecting with my family, because I was, I was really homesick. I didn't speak English, I, you know, I didn't know anybody, I didn't, I didn't have Marty in my life back then. So <laughs> it was pretty lonely, but the best thing that I could come up with was reconnect with my roots through food. And that's when I started to pay attention to food, and I was like, I was really like weirded out when I saw people like eating their cars while driving to work people like sipping coffee and walking, you know, to whatever they, like, nobody took the time. Like, I realized that food in America was mostly, I'm not generalizing here, but it was mostly fuel. You know, you put it in your body and it keeps you going. Like, if you're tired, you drink coffee, it gives you the impression that you're not tired. And then when you eat, you just put like, a bunch of calories in your body and it gives you the energy to, you know, burn while you're working or doing whatever you want to do. But it, it, I realized that in Morocco, it was a little bit different. It was actually like a social event. You go and you eat because you want to connect with people. Even if you're like arguing, and we used to argue a lot around the table. And it was a ritual where in the morning we would wake up, it was frantic, chaotic. Um, you know, my mom, my grandma, my aunt would go to the kitchen like earlier, make breakfast, pancakes, coffee, tea, you know, butter and all that shit. Put it in a big table and then we will gather around it. But we're arguing like a Jewish family. Like you guys seen them like in movies, like we argued during breakfast. And and what we do is we decide what we're gonna have for lunch every day while we're having breakfast. And then when breakfast is over, the kids go to school, the grown-ups go to work, the people stay at home to cook, and then grandpa will go to the market and go to get the vegetables and the you know, the meat and all of that. And every day is the same story where people debate what they want to have for breakfast, for lunch, and then 
he listens and he goes to the market and he gets whatever the fuck he wants and brings it back, <laughs> dumps it and he goes away and they have to cook it. So in a way, it was the ritual that we had every day, but I never understood how important that was, those interactions, no matter how dysfunctional, brutal, you know, combative can be sometimes. Like, it, it was really important that we would go through that. Um, um, and that's, that's why I got into cooking. So I finished my master's degree in economics, and by the time I was done, I had this really huge fear that if I went on to go get a PhD or whatever, and, or go work for a bank immediately, I would be forced not to cook anymore. And that's when the fear settled in, and I said, well, I'm gonna just open a restaurant for three months, open it, at least I'm gonna have a place to go eat, and then I'll go back to doing like the big boy things that I was supposed to do. Opened my first restaurant with about $3,000, $3,700 that I had on my account. And that was in 96, and I never left. So it, I stumbled on this thing, and it's been the best thing that happened to me. And as Scott said, um, I've never worked for any chef before. I've never worked in any kitchen before. And you can see from the way I dress, like I'm not the conventional chef with the uh, whites and the, I mean, you've known me for a long time. Um, so I, I just try to have fun with food. I don't try to take it too seriously. Uh, what we do is very technical. And, and the process that I went through to get to this point is teaching myself from memory. So I never had the guts or the courage to call my mom or call anybody in Morocco. Um, and ask them how to make something, because they will be pretty much saying, why the hell did you go to America to learn how to make pancakes? Or learn how to make couscous, you could have stayed here, and we would have made it for you, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so I would literally sit there and relive the moments that I spent in the kitchen watching them make stuff. And that was um, a double-edged sword, because on one hand, it allowed me to make stuff from my own perspective, from my own like vision and my memory of it, and you li literally, it, I realize you can taste food in your head before you even put it in your mouth. You literally can taste it. And, and I would like sit there, I was like, yeah, she was telling me about my fucked up aunt and how she got divorced and the kids were blah, blah, blah. And then she put the onions in the pot, then she added some spices. It looked kind of yellow, so it must be turmeric or saffron or something like that. So I will relive those moments and from there I would make the food. Um, obviously, the first couple times, it was disastrous. Like, it literally was, was awful. But I just kept on going because, first of all, I was so broke that I couldn't, like, go to restaurants and eat. And second of all, it was the only way for me to really, you know, stay connected. And, and that's how the, the journey started. Um, but obviously, you guys are interested in food, and I hope that somehow, when you cook, you have some connection to whatever you're coming from and wherever you're going and things like that. So the food that I ended up making, um, so I, I came here when I was 17, um, and I've been here for a lot longer than when I was in Morocco. So the food that I make now is a reflection of who I am. So the roots are in Morocco, so I use a lot of ingredients or techniques from Morocco. But obviously, I use a lot of, um, a lot of things from, from the Bay Area, especially from the Bay Area in California. And as Marty can attest to it, you know, sometimes when we cook together, it's really the line is so blurry as to what's really Moroccan and what's not Moroccan. But once we find that spot, that sweet spot, where the two cultures or the two cuisines merge harmoniously, then it, it becomes something that is bigger and better than um, both ends. Yes? Has your family tasted your food? And yeah. It was, it was really cool because like after I started cooking, um, I finally brought my mom from Morocco. And I was like, for three months, I was telling my staff, this little Moroccan woman is gonna come and kick your asses. She is so good. I mean, she's like, she's an unbelievable cook. And then when she came, she refused to cook. Because I, I served her dinner the first time, the first day she came in. She tasted the food, she goes, I can taste that it's Moroccan, but I don't recognize it, I don't know how you did it. So that was the best compliment. Um, because to me, the fear has always been, am I getting too far away from my roots? Am I just making food that everybody else is making? Um, and there was a struggle there because initially, like when, it, when you start thinking about food and asking why is it made this way, rather than just, let's just make food that tastes good. Um, in Morocco, um, the best chefs are those who can make you taste food and it takes you back in time to when you were a little kid or you were growing up with your grandma and you can say like, oh, it tastes exactly like that person used to make it. That's success for, for, for a great chef. 
when I came to America, I realized that a lot of people are more interested in what's going to be done, what, who's doing the most innovative things, who's mixing this with that, who's doing something that I've never had before. That, that, that aspect of you know, discovery is really huge in America, especially like on, on, on the coasts, um, you know, California and New York. Um, in Morocco, they don't care about that. Like what they care about, like make me something that's going to take me back in time. That is the, the, the epitome of a great chef or, or a great dish. So when she came, she was able to taste those flavors, but she had no idea how it was made. And to me, that was the, the best compliment. And obviously, she did not do anything for three months when she was staying with me. She did not cook anything whatsoever. She deserved it because she cooked for me for 17 years. So um, let's get on to some cooking. Um, the first thing I'm going to show you um, is how to make preserved lemons and how to make couscous. Couscous, I think to me, is one of the greatest dishes that, that I brought from Morocco. Um, when I first came to the States, I was uh, petrified when I saw the little boxes um, in the rice aisle, uh, you know, at Safeway and Whole Foods. And you just, like, you pick it up, and I was so excited, always like hand rolled couscous, but then you read the directions, and it literally says, add boiling water. And that's it, that's couscous. So I was excited, like, Americans are so smart, like, they figured this shit out. <laughs> And then I followed the directions and it was so awful. It was like it, it, it had absolutely nothing to do with the couscous that I grew up with. I thought I messed it up and we, we got other boxes and I started making it. It never worked. So obviously that was frustrating. And hand rolling couscous is almost like making pasta. And it was the hardest chapter to write um, in the book because it's one of those things where it's so simple when you make it from start to finish. It's so simple. Once you get it, you get it. It's like riding a bicycle. You don't even think about it. You get on the bicycle. You don't even say, okay, this is what, these are the dynamics. This is like the physics of it. You don't even think about that. You get on the bicycle and you roll. Um, couscous is like that. You will fail, 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 and you fall on your ass. You have to get up again and do it again. It would be clumpy, it would be mushy, it would be this, it would be that. It would be so inconsistent, but eventually you will get it. And it just happens like that. You know, I can't explain it. So to put that into words, it was the hardest chapter to write because it, it has a lot to do with feel. It has a lot to do with like understanding. And you talk to yourself when you make couscous. It's virtually impossible to be like engaged in a lot of conversation and discussion with other people around you. You have to be taught like you you making it and you're rolling couscous in this big clay pot, and then you, you have to understand like the 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 granules from the semolina are touching your hand, and you feel the edges. So like, do you guys know about um, coarse semolina? It comes from dur durum wheat. So it's basically a really hard wheat. Um, and you crack it, and it has to be coarse. So when it's crushed, um, I wish we had some visuals. Like you have pieces of semolina that have all these angles um, and, and a lot of surfaces, lo like little diamonds. And when you steam couscous, you want to avoid the contact between the semolina. So if you have two pieces of semolina that have surfaces like this, and they're touching, there's a lot of contact, and that's what makes semolina and couscous stick together and they become, you know, clumpy. Um, so the, the idea of rolling couscous is to get the biggest pieces of semolina, and then you roll them with flour and water, and you keep rolling them and making these spheres to basically, um, you know, even out the edges. And when you have two spheres, the point of contact is just one. Instead of the pieces, all the pieces connecting like this, you have the, the couscous basically touching on only one point. And that's what keeps it fluffy. That's what makes the steam go through the, all the little spheres and, and cook it without having to glue it together. So there's a lot of science in it, but we don't understand. I mean, we don't think about it. But when I start cooking, I start like asking, asking myself why certain things happen, um, rather than just making them the way we used to make them, I, I want to understand what was going on. So basically, we start with coarse semolina. We're not going to do the demo for how to make couscous from, from scratch. But you start with coarse semolina. You roll it. You dry it overnight. And then that's what you get. You get something that is very similar to this. And if you're really, really good at it, all the spheres should be approximately the same size. So when you steam them, you don't end up with some that are bigger that will take longer and some that are smaller that will get mushy. So it's just a skill and it, and it takes a little bit of time and, and you have the book so please just take the time to read it and don't, don't give up if you fail the first time. It's like a fun thing, you can do it and laugh at yourself and with your friends and whatever and you can always turn into polenta, you know? If it gets mushy or comfy, just add water or stock and make it into polenta and you'd be like nobody would even notice. So, so just go at it. So we figured out a way at the restaurant to make it 
um, and it's a little bit faster. So you can see here, this is the hand-rolled couscous. And um, what we do is we use a little bit of stock. This is vegetable stock. And depending on, um, depending on what you're going to use the couscous with. So the couscous in itself, every little grain, every little um, you know, sphere, it's so insignificant. Like it's, it's, it's nothing. You can put it in your mouth. It doesn't taste like anything by itself. It, you can't tell this, you know, the texture of it. But together, it comes together as being this really great thing. And we eat couscous once a week in Morocco on Fridays because everybody goes to the mosque um, before lunch. Everybody comes back home, and then you eat this couscous. And there's this, like, um, there's this story where like, every single grain is a step closer to heaven. So people on Friday, they really want to go to heaven. So they just go <laughs> pray, come back home on time, and just sit together, and then they eat. And um, for each grain that you consume is one step further to heaven. For each grain that somebody else consumes that you make. Like, so we make two platters, one for us at the house, and one to give away at the mosque for poor people. For the, each grain that they consume is two steps closer. So people tend to be more giving than what they actually keep at home. Um, so there's a lot of um, you know, intellectualism behind the couscous. It's not just like it's a side dish or anything like that. There's a lot of stories and a lot of mythology that goes into it. So this is the couscous. And um, as I said, if you want to make couscous with some seafood, then what I do is this is the couscousier. Um, which is basically a two-part vessel. Uh, the bottom part is just like any pot. It basically has liquid, vegetables, or any meat that you want to cook with the couscous. And on the top part is where you steam the couscous. So basically the steam, so we don't make a stock per se in Morocco. We don't make stocks. We always cook, we start with water. So, but the bottom part is the braise. So basically the vegetables, so you make your own stock as you cook. Then the meat goes in there and all of the things that will gonna be mounted on the couscous will basically be at the lower part, the wet stuff, and then the couscous will be on top. Um, and the idea is to cook the couscous and flavor it with whatever you're going to serve it with. So if, if it's seafood, I tend to put, um, so if I break down a fish, I'll put the bones and the tail and the fins in there. If I'm doing chicken, I'll do the wings and the feet and the head and all the scraps and trim from the, from the chicken. If it's lamb, I'll do the bones and the fat and all that. It will be here at the bottom. Um, the one thing in Morocco that we do is, and I've always questioned this, is when you cook couscous in Morocco, it's not about the meat or the vegetables. So people are so poor in Morocco. The, the, the main thing on the plate is never the meat. It's always the vegetable, the sauce, and the bread that you eat it with. So here in America, it's the other way around, uh, where you, know, you go to a restaurant and you get a plate that is like probably bigger than this, and half of it is protein. Like, it's a 28 ounce steak, you know, it's a whole chicken, it's this and that. So for us, um, we don't like to eat a lot of, well, it's not like we don't like to eat a lot of meat. We can't afford a lot of meat to buy a lot of meat. So we take the meat and we try to extract as much flavor as possible out of it. Um, we like the, the, the hard part, like the shoulder and the leg and the knuckles and all of that. Nobody cares about the rack of lamb. So for me, when I came here and I saw that the rack of lamb was like $25 a pound, I was like, this is crazy. Like it has the least amount of flavor. Like it's tender, it's clean, it's, you know, it looks pretty, it looks, you know, for, you know, it's like perfect for Instagram, but it literally like the, the shoulder has so much more flavor um, because of the connective tissue, because of the fat, because of the bones, because of the kind of meat. Um, it's so gelatinous and the ratio of fat and skin and, connective tissue is so perfect. So we, if you go to a butcher in Morocco, you actually have to be um, a really good customer to get the shoulder. And if you're like a, a bad customer, you're gonna end up with the rack of lamb or the <laughs> chops. So um, the one thing is um, we try to extract as much as possible from the proteins. And to do that, we cook it for a long period of time, which is something that people cannot afford to do in America because everybody works. You have 30 minutes to make your food and, and eat it and all of that stuff. Uh, but in Morocco, we have a lot of time and, and it takes three hours to extract that flavor. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you, first of all, how to do the couscous, the way we do it at the restaurant. And for this simple preparation, I'm just gonna start with um, vegetable stock. It's just made with water and aromatics and vegetables. Um, you know, um, you got carrots, celery, and onions. And basically what I'm gonna do, so this is already made, and this is the hand-rolled couscous. I'm gonna take one of these. And you just put the hand-rolled couscous in a mixing bowl. Do you have any brands you trust? 
Um, you know, Justo's has really good um, couscous, so I would buy Justo's if I were, you know, to buy it from the store. Um, Anson Mills also has really good couscous and they use really good products, so that, which is really cool. Um, so yeah, those are the two that I would, um, Mid East, I think there's a brand in the market called Mid East. Um, they tend to be like really bad, so I would, I would avoid those, yeah. So we heat up the, the, the uh, vest stock to, it's like a slow simmer, then we'll let, we'll let it rest. Um, I'm gonna add a little bit of saffron for the color and the flavor, olive oil, and some salt. And you can see that the recipe is so exact, you know, like all the grams are in my head. Um, so basically, and you can also, uh, for people in Morocco that use saffron, um, it's a sign of affluence. That means that you're really rich and you make a lot of money. So even like poor people will kill themselves when they have guests to go get saffron. Um, for most people, what we use is turmeric. Um, it has some flavor, but it's not, it's not the same flavor, and I actually prefer it. So you can use a combination of both, or you can use just the saffron if you want to impress anybody, um, or you can just use the turmeric. Um, and turmeric right now is really hot because of the, uh, the new discovered you know, health benefits to it. Yeah, so everybody's fucking juicing um, turmeric. So once it gets to a little simmer and you can see it, um, ideally you want to let it sit for about, you know, you can see a little steam coming out. You want to let it sit for about half an hour to infuse it um, and get the flavor out of the, uh, out of the saffron. So we're just going to accelerate this process. Then I'm going to add the couscous and the infusion together. And literally just give them a little stir. And when Chef Damari makes this at the restaurant, he always uses a spoon and he never, ever puts his hands in the couscous. Right, Chef Damari? Yeah. <laughs> um, so you can see the couscous is really like, it's, it's fluffy, it's not like clumped up, it's not, you know, it's not, um, it's not sticking together. Um, and I'm gonna let this um, sit for about, you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes just so that the couscous can absorb all the all moisture. And one thing about gluten, um, it's very sticky, it's very starchy. So when, when people just use a tremendous amount of liquid with the couscous, th that starch is gonna come out really quickly. And the heat helps it you know, come out. If you do the steaming part, instead of just adding boiling water, if you steam it, the starch does not get out all at once and you can contain it a little bit. Um, so at this point, we're just gonna pretend that um, we're just gonna pretend that the couscous has been sitting there for a few minutes. And obviously in Morocco we don't have plastic gloves, so I just want to be sanitary. Uh, but fuck it, man. No, that's, that's how we do it. I mean, that's how we do it. Um, so basically, all you do is you go in and you literally separate all the grains. And this takes a little minute, and if you can have, if, if, if there's like little clumps that really are difficult and you don't have time to like, just put them aside, you know, get rid of them until the whole thing is pretty much loose and um, ready to go into the steamer. The steamer over there, it, at the bottom, we just have water, and I'm just gonna add some carrots, celery, and onions. Um, so it's gonna be a very clean um, tasting couscous. You can't, re I mean, th this is what I'm saying, like, it's, it's a feel thing. So, like, if you really squeeze it together, it will clump up. Um, but if you just, like, literally just rub it between your hands, like, everything will fall down back to the bowl, but you're going to be left with these. Um, I usually, like, will work these to get them smaller, but now I'm just going to do it a little bit quicker so that we can expedite this process. Um, but the, pr the idea is, like, the whole thing is gluten. There's no, I mean, we try to make um, buckwheat, Couscous, but it was disgusting. Um, I think um, David Kinch, whom um, worked with Marty as well, he was from Manresa. He called me about five or six years ago, and he was really interested in developing some sort of couscous that doesn't have gluten. Um, but I don't think he was successful. Um, I mean, shit happens for some reason, and, and this is what it works the best with. And, and you know, we tried a couple things, but we always end up going back to this. So. As you can see, like I'm just gonna take a little bit here that is pretty cool. You can see like it's really loose. 
you know? It's not like what you would get if you were just to pour uh, boiling water on it. So we're gonna pretend that this whole thing is, is loose. And then we're gonna go into the second part. So for, for the water, we have water, we have salary. And again, you can see how precise this is. Um, and another, another thing that I want to talk about, you guys can all see this. I'm sure you guys have these two components in your kitchen somehow. So it's just a strainer, and this is a pot. And you just want to make sure that the bottom of this steamer does not touch the water. So there's plenty of water in there. I'm just going to add the carrots, celery, and onions. Bring it to a boil. And then once it comes to a boil, I will just take the couscous. And put it in the steamer. And this will steam for about an hour. The way we do it, like it will steam for about an hour. And we'll take it out. So this is going to look like shit on video because it has this, all these clumps. But uh, we're just going to pretend that they're not here. So, so th this will steam for about an hour. Once it's steamed, um, we'll take it into a big mixing bowl and we're gonna fluff it again and get rid of the clumps and then put it back in there. So you get rid of all the, the, the heat from it, you put it back and you restart again for another 15 minutes, take it out and you do it four times. And after four times, four steamings, that's when you get the rice couscous. Um, this is couscous that has been steamed three times already. Um, and you can see it doubles in size. So from, from the little grains that we had, these, for the little spheres to this is double in size. So it absorbed all the liquid and all the moisture that we, that, that we wanted to absorb. And, and basically it's all loose. Um, and Chef Damari did a really good job at separating all of these. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to put it back in here in the big steamer. This is the traditional Moroccan steamer, and this will steam for another 15, 20 minutes, and this will be part of the couscous we're going to serve you. So couscous in itself does not have a lot of flavor, um, but it becomes a, a vehicle for adding a lot of um, flavor to food. So whatever you put, whatever you serve couscous with, is that's, that's what's going to be emphasized. One of my favorite ways to eat couscous is basically with brown butter and preserved lemons. That is the simplest way to, to, to eat couscous and enjoy it. Uh, we get a little bit too technical at the restaurant with preparations and dishes. We change them seasonally. I'm going to show you a way that we do it right now for a tasting menu where we do it with pumpkin because of the season and uh, sea urchin and um, roe. So um, we'll do that in a little bit. But we're just going to wait for this couscous to come up. Um, but as you can see, it's really a cool process. It's very meditative. And, and it, like when you do it, it takes a couple hours. But it's really worth it at the end. Because once, once, what, once you get into eating really good couscous, it's virtually really hard and impossible to go to the box stuff. You don't cover it? No, I don't cover it. Um, a lot of people do cover it, or they do. Um, cheese clot, like this little thing um, at the bottom. But um, because they're afraid that the couscous is going to make it through the holes, I don't worry about that. Like the weight of the couscous will basically keep it from going down. Um, a couple grains might, you know, a couple spheres might go down to the water, but who cares? Any questions, you guys? Is the general goal of the steaming really, are you just trying to like cook the starch? So the goal of the steaming is basically to give it the moisture that it needs to fluff up um, without giving it the liquid itself. So it's a gradual addition of, of moisture. So you have this hard piece of, 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 it's almost like a pasta. It is a pasta. So you have this sphere. You want to give it as much um, moisture as, as it needs to fluff up to the fullest. Um, and then, but you don't want to pour the liquid directly on it. So that's why the steam, it gets trapped. So all the steam that's coming up is the excess that would have otherwise gone into the grains if you were to pour the water or the liquid in it. So it's really a cool process. And I think it's really ingenious. I don't know who invented couscous. It's very popular in North Africa. 
is very popular in, in Europe. Um, when the Moors um, invaded um, Europe, they took with them couscous. And that is one of the things that stayed with Europe when the Moors were kicked back out of, of, of Europe. It's ready. Yeah, it's ready. It's cold, so we need just to heat it up. Yeah, so I would rather give it to you um, warm than, than cold. So we just heated it up. Um, and it's just like we, we figured out the, the timing that it needs to cook, and we just split it so that it we would never give it too much steaming at one time and make it mushy. So the more periods that you do it, the better. It's like with risotto, you keep adding little by little rather than just um, giving it everything in one shot. Water, um, carrots, onions, uh, bay leaves, thyme. You can do a lot of aromatics that you that you have in the kitchen. But if you didn't have to warm it up, you basically just stir it in the I'll tell you what. If you don't have to warm it up, you can just put it in a pint container like this and put it in the microwave, and it would be awesome. So like this last step, literally, it's the same couscous. And you can literally just add a little bit of stock or water, put it in the microwave, and zip it for like maybe a minute depending on your microwave, and then it will be nice and fluffy. Because I don't know if you guys use microwaves here, but it's one of the greatest inventions of all times. Like, I have absolutely no problem using microwaves. I think they're great. Um, but when, when I discovered that I could use it to steam couscous for the last steaming, I, it was like, I, was, I felt like Einstein. I really did. <laughs> and it comes out really perfectly. And the fact that the pint container is sealed you know, there's liquid in there, and it steams because of the microwave, because of the, you know, the mechanics of it, and then it steams within this, con you know, contained container, and it's just, it's magic. It's really one of the greatest inventions. So, so while the couscous is going on, um, I'm gonna move on. How much time do we have? Twenty plus minutes. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the second greatest thing that Moroccans have contributed to the world of food. <laughs> Um, and that is preserved lemons. Um, growing up in Morocco, um, I came from Marrakesh, where we have a lot of citrus. And when we have that must citrus coming out and the trees are full, we don't know what to do with it. We're not into lemonade, so we don't make a lot of lemonade. We're, we don't use um, lemon juice necessarily to season stuff, salads and things like that. We like vinegars, because they're more fermented and they have like a, a deeper, you know, uh, flavor than just like um, lemon juice. So um, what we do with it is we preserve it. So you get like, we harvest the, the lemons, um, take them home, and the ladies will get together around this big, you know, container with all these lemons and a lot of salt and just big jars, clay jars, and we preserve lemons. And the funny thing is, I think the preserved lemon is, is, is one of the most amazing things. And literally, like you start from this, and you get into to this. Um, and what, what do you think about preserved lemons? When we started working together, it was kind of like a game changer. It's a game changer. It's a totally unique, yeah. flavor. But the cool part is like um, when you juice a lemon, a regular lemon, or when you use it for dressing or whatever, you get rid of the pit, the skin. So that's discarded. You just, you're interested in the juice. Uh, Moroccans, we get everything backwards, so we're interested in the pit, but we don't really care about the juice. Um, so you, th the way to make it um, is really cool. Uh, so let me show you how to do that. Uh, yeah, and basically you can either, sometimes like you can take the syrup from the previous batch and re yeah, and it's really cool. And it, it's, it takes a little bit longer, but the results are much better. So I have just kosher salt here. You can see there's a lot of it. Um, if you really want to cheat and you think that it's too salty for you, and I'm going to give you like, Chef Demar, can we give everybody like a little sample of the preserved lemons so they can taste it by, this, by itself? Yeah, here, once you take this, here. Maybe you can just give them little spoons because I, I really think it's one of the best things that, that, that uh, came out of Morocco. So we, we use a lot of salt, and then with a knife, you. And I don't like to use um, Meyer lemons. To me, they don't have enough acid to cure the, preserve, you know, the lemons. And they're sweeter, so it doesn't work for me at, uh, at all. I do a quick preserved, uh, a quick cure for Meyer lemons, but it's just like a day. 
um, overnight and I slice them really thin and I sprinkle them with salt and sugar and the next day they're perfect for salads. But um, to, to get the best preserved lemons, you use Eureka lemons or Lisbon. Um, they're really good. So you can see you, you send it on its butt and you make two cuts uh, lengthwise but you don't cut them all the way through because what you need is um, to be able to stuff as much salt as possible. It's never enough and then we take a jar Pardon me? You're not aiming for a no. Salt. No. And that's what's really cool about Moroccan you know, cooking. It's never, there, there's no recipes. Um, there's just a way of cooking that is handed down from one generation to another. And some of the best cooks in Morocco are these ladies who work in very affluent homes uh, where they can get paid. And basically, they have recipes in their heads of how to cook certain things. And they're the best chefs. There's no doubt about it. They're called dadas. Um, big ladies, you know, spend a lot of time in the kitchen and they're like so seasoned, but they love what they do. And basically those ladies will never give recipes to anybody, no matter who they are, except for their daughters. Because they want to make sure that their daughter, one of their daughters will get the job after they pass. And it just stays in the family from generation to, to generation. And most of them, when you ask them for, for recipes, they always give you the wrong stuff, always. So <laughs> nobody even asks. So we're gonna like shove as many lemons as possible in there. That sounds like my restaurants. I always freak out when I hear that sound. Um. And once you put the lemons with the salt in there, um, you can leave the jar sealed for about a day. And a lot of the juice from the lemons will be extracted. And this jar will probably be half full of juice. Um, and that's what we want. So I just seal it put it away for a day, um, the juice will come up to here, you shake it really well, and then after one day, I'll squeeze some lemon juice, and I will fill it all the way to the top. So we're just gonna pretend that this is all the way to the top. No, no. So, and you are put it away for about three months at least. Uh, you can use it after one month, it will not taste anything like lemon, but the most important ingredient in this preparation is time. You need to have the time to do it. You can't rush it. There's no way you can. We try to do it sous vide, you know, where you, you expedite that process of cure. Like, it doesn't work. It really doesn't work. Uh, we have preserved lemons right now that are five years old. And they look black, almost black. Um, they go from yellow to orange, like, and they start getting darker and darker. In color. They literally t turn almost black. Um, they're, they're intense. Um, I'll give you some when you come up. Um, so this stays somewhere cold and um, dark for about a month. You can use it after a month. I don't recommend it. Anywhere between three months to six months is ideal. Um, and then when you're done, you end up with something like this. So the, the, you, you can't juice these. Um, and you can see like it's all soft. The most important part is the pit. So basically, you clean the, you clean the core. Um, and I use the whole thing. I use the whole thing. It, once you make these, they're the best, the best presents. Like, you can make them now for Christmas. And people will be so happy. They think you love them so much because you took the time to do this. So the most important part of this preserved lemon is this part. So this is what we use at the restaurant. Um, you can slice it and put it in salads. You can you know, put it on top of steaks, you can dice it and, and mix it in with couscous. It is literally something that you will never be able to live without. It's that simple, it's that cheap, and you can make it when lemons are really cheap and not have to worry about it for a whole year or two years. So if there's anything you guys can get away from um, this class is go home and make some fucking preserved lemons. It is so <laughs> delicious. Um, and I'm gonna give you some, some, some little bit to, to taste. I think Chef Damar is doing that. Um, and then the other part is, you can see we don't throw this away. This is the core. Um, so what, what I do with these, they're, they're salty as you, know, as you can imagine. They're acidic, they have some tartness. You put them in stews. So you just take a couple of these, put them in stews or braises or your pasta sauce or whatever. People would think you're a genius. Oh my God, what did you do? And it's just like, it's a Japanese technique that I came across like when I went to Japan, but it's fucking preserved lemons. It's like plain and simple, it's preserved lemons. And then the last part that is really important, this is lemon juice. 
that's been sitting there for a couple months is gonna get salty, it's gonna get really thick, and it's gonna change in color, it's gonna become like clearer, it's not, it's not gonna be as cloudy, and it's delicious. So instead of using salt, straight up salt, you can use that liquid to season your salads. So you, you can see that how you can use the whole thing. And I, I literally, I cannot emphasize this, and Marty has worked with me for a long time, we've known each other for many years. If there's one thing that I want anybody to take away from this, it's this little thing here. Um, and the hardest part about it, anybody can do it. It's not couscous, it's not hand rolling couscous. That, that, that is really hard to get to a point where you're comfortable with it, and it works out all the time. This is so simple. So it, you have absolutely, you have zero, if you guys work at Google, you can do this shit, I'm, I'm telling you. <laughs> So it's not, it's not that hard. Um, Is there anything in the pack to be able to use them decoratively later, or why not just break them down smaller so that you can get the salt back? So once, once I get to a point, and that is a great question, once I get to a point when I'm really happy with them, if the purpose is to use them on a daily basis, I would let them be, uh, get to this point. So what I do at that point, if I just let them sit in the syrup longer, they'll get darker and more intense. So I take them out rinse them off in cold water, and then I will get this part and just like slice it, or I can chop it. And I think we have a little sample somewhere. Chef Damari, can I have the chopped up preserved lemons? And then we stop the curing part by adding um, olive oil. So the oil will stop everything, and they will stay the way at the stage, they will stay like that for a few months. There's no problem. So uh, rinsing them off and taking them off of the, of the liquid will stop that curing process, and then you end up with preserved lemons that will be the same consistency, the same flavor. And the oil that you put them, the mix them in is amazing. So once you're done with, with the preserved lemon, you're left with really flavorful, um, literally some of the best olive oil. So I'm gonna give you guys the ones that are sitting up front. You get to taste some of this stuff here. Is it legal to do this? Go for yeah. it. The health There's department. I can just take one of these. Yeah. We don't like refrigeration with this process. It needs to be a room temp. If you put it in the refrigerator, it's, the temperature is so low, it, it, it literally almost stops that whole process of curing. So. Have you tried nice. it with uh, the same technique with grapefruits or other We try to be sizes? creative with that stuff, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work. No. Um, limes don't work because the pit is not thick enough. Um, a grapefruit is too thick and it just becomes spongy and not very flavorful. I think it's the acid and the level of tartness and, and acidity in the lemons that makes them so perfect. Do you ever measure the, the pH for? No. That's too complicated, man. That's like Google stuff. <laughs> you are at Google, though. I Other know. audience questions? We have, a, we have a few minutes. I've got plenty of questions for Chef, but I'd love to open it up to the audience. So if you have a question, we'll ask Chef Murad to, to repeat the question so we can get this on uh, the video in. So any burning questions? We get up in the morning, we stuff our faces at 7.30. Then we go to work or to school, we literally don't eat anything until 12.30 when we come back for lunch. And then people take a nap, then go back to work or school, and then they come back for dinner. But the main meal is lunch. It's never dinner. So dinner is like leftover from lunch or a little snack. Um, so no, there's no snacks. And, and I just came back from Morocco three weeks ago. I went there for nine days. And um, you know, I ate so much, and sometimes we had two dinners because there's so many people to see that I have like an early dinner at seven o'clock and a late dinner at 10 o'clock because I just want to see all my family members and friends and make everybody happy. And when I came back, I was like, oh, this is like, okay, Murad from America. I came back and I was like, oh my God, I got to get on a scale because I probably gained 10 pounds. I lost weight when I was eating all that, that food. And I literally think it's the, the quality of the food like when I first came to America, I was like, people were freaking out about like, okay, we go to the farmer's market as if like some luxury. Like the whole world goes to the farmer's market every day. That's the way it is, <laughs> you know? So not going to the farmer's market is the weird part. You know, it's not the other way around. So when people go to the farmer's market on Saturday and they buy a piece for like $5, oh my God, that's like a crazy idea. That's what happens. And usually the farmer's market in all over the world, most of the world is cheaper than the market because you 
you know, you're eliminating the middleman. For some reason in America, it's like the other way around where you can buy peach that is really healthy for $5 at the market, but you can buy a lot of food from a store for a lot less. But that's, that's like the mass production of food. It's, it's all screwed up. The whole thing is screwed up. So we got to rethink the whole, the whole process. Um, OK, so we got to rush a little bit through this. Um, the last thing I want to do for you guys is uh, show you how to make uh, couscous in the simplest way. Um, what I do, and if I were to die today, the last thing I would love to eat is couscous with brown butter. Um, for all of you who are like really you know, health conscious and think that fat is bad and, and, and you know, um, maybe this is not the part you should be looking at. Um, so I have a pot here. And I have some brown butter. And I'm not going to lie to you. We put a lot of brown. I mean, let's just do it right. So that is, that is for probably like one portion. Uh, we heat up the brown butter. Uh, you can, if you make brown butter from scratch while you're making this, you can just put the butter in a pot, bring it up, let it cook off. The milk solid will brown. The, um, the liquid will evaporate. The, you know, the whey will evaporate. So you're left with fat and um, milk solids that are browning in there. So it's the most delicious thing. Do you like brown butter? OK, you're lying. Um, so huh? just butter. Yeah. So I'm going to add a little bit of the preserved lemons just to infuse it. A little bit of salt. And you need to be careful with this step with the salt because the preserved lemons are salty. Um, so you just, you just got to play it off. And as soon as it starts to foam, I'll take the couscous, add it in. And then guess what's going to happen? The couscous is going to absorb all that butter, and nobody would know. <laughs> Just, um, I mean, unsalted butter, because you need to be, I mean, every time you buy salted butter, you're basically paying like $8 for salt, $8 a pound, because every gram is added to the weight of the butter that you buy. So you can just add your own salt, and you don't have to pay that much for it. So this is pretty much ready to go. And at the restaurant, what we do to keep it seasonal, we have some pumpkin that's been roasted and diced. So we're going to add that to the couscous. Okay, take it off the, uh, the heat. We have a small plate here. And at the restaurant, we, we use, uni, like right now, we're using uni and roe, smoked roe. Um, Where do you look for inspiration for how you enhance the couscous? Um, Is roe and uni traditional Moroccan? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I mean, the way we eat couscous, as I was saying like at the beginning, I don't know if I emphasize that point. The way we use it in Morocco is like literally overcooked meat, overcooked vegetables, but the grain, like the, the, the couscous is the most important part, and people just eat it by hand. Like you literally again, make a little bowl and flip it in your mouth. But at the restaurant we try, like whenever we use couscous as an entree, we try to cook the vegetables separately. The proteins are cooked separately if we ever use proteins with it. But for this, it's just like, it's an idea of like, to me, it's like, it's almost like rice in Japan, where you have like a vehicle. Like the, if you talk to a lot of sushi chefs, they'll say that cooking the rice is the most important part of sushi. And most people don't think of it that way. They think about the fish and how unique it is, and how scarce it is, and blah, 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 blah. But most chefs in Japan will, will, will literally tell you the most important part is the rice. I feel the same way about this. So I can put you know, uni, I can put roe, I can put merguez, which is lamb sausage, I can put beef, a stew, um, a piece of fish. It doesn't really matter. To me, the, the couscous is the most important part. But it's, it's such a clean vehicle for anything that you can literally use it. But I think the, the most important part is the grain, but also the butter, the butter. And nobody will complain about the butter. Um, so we'll use some uni with this. This is Japanese uni from Hokkaido. And just sprinkle it all over the place. 
And just to impress you guys, this is not as much as we use at the restaurant. So if you come to the <laughs> restaurant and you see like two little tongs on it, it's because it's really expensive. And then the row. And just to finish it, finish it off, um, and this is what makes us like justify charging people what we charge. We just <laughs> put a lot of blossoms. Here we go. And flowers. And there's your $30 couscous. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions, you guys? So I'll start with the first question, and we've got a few for questions if you have them. So, Chef, you've, you've been on TV, you've written a book, you've got restaurants that you're running. What is your proudest moment that you could think back that you want to share with the audience today? The proudest, like, um, from a professional level or from a personal level? Why not both? One uh, of each. Perso Personal level is when my mom came and I was really expecting her to school us on how to make Moroccan food. And, and the biggest fear that I had was for her to say, this is not Moroccan food. That was like the biggest nightmare that I was imagining. But when she said, my God, this tastes like back home, this reminds me of back home, that's, that was the first moment when I felt that food is really like, it has to have a sense of place. Um, if you were to go to Morocco, to where I grew up, Marrakesh, and go to the night market called Jamafna, where there's all this street food, and you would eat a bite of anything there. It will taste so much better and so much more delicious than if you were to take the same exact bite and eat it, you know, in, in San Francisco n near the Golden Gate Bridge. It just doesn't add. So for me, food has to have a sense of place. So when she said that, it allowed me to think that I brought something from Morocco and I made it fit this environment where it has a sense of place. So that was a, a very proud moment. Professionally, I think um, uh, when we first got the mission star at, um, at Aziza, it was very sweet for me, but it just happened to be on the same year that two of my best friends, James Scheibus from Comey and Jeremy Fox from Ubuntu at the time, got it also at the same time. And um, Marty was working at Ubuntu at the time, so he was responsible for that star as well. So when we all get that, that star the same year, it was the sweetest moment of my professional career to this day. So. Very special, thank you. Any audience questions? How many people are going to go back and make couscous? Well, that's not how bad. many people are going to try to grab that plate in front? <laughs> <laughs> how, about, how about preserved lemons? All right, well then I did my job. Anyways. Chef, one last question. So you have a new restaurant coming uh, on board, Amara. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that will be different from what you've done in the past? Yeah, so we had Aziza for 18 years and it was one of the most special restaurants in the country. Um, it started out as this idea of me just making a place for myself to go eat when I'm going to conquer the world and make a lot of money. Um, and it turned into like, it was so organic and it went through so many phases where initially it was like a place where I would recreate the dishes that I grew up you know, on and I, I was eating when I was a little boy. And then when I saw the limitations of that, um, we start to experiment a little bit. We start to ask, why are we making couscous this way? Why are we making this stew with this, you know, with this sauce, sweet sauce, blah, blah, blah. But we start to, you know, peel away all those mysteries of why Moroccan food do, was the way it was. And then when we start to experiment, that's when I met Marty and we start like to, add stuff from California and from the Bay Area to my food and, 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 and take it to a, a new direction. And then eventually at Murad, we you know, end up like summing up all those experiences and journey into that one spot. Um, so Aziza became this place that was really unique. It was selected as one of the 30 most important restaurants in the country um, over the last 30 years. So, and people had a really strong connection with that place. It was not just the food, but for some reason, People, when they go to Aziza, they really have a soft spot for where they used to sit or where the bar was, or I proposed to my girlfriend, you know, um, on that table. I had my 18th birthday here. So people had stories. They did not just go there to eat. 
And I, I was not, re I mean, I heard about that shit, but I, I really didn't, like, it didn't add up in my head. But when we opened Murad, and Murad was a really expensive project, uh, people started to compare the two. Aziza is neglected, Murad is the new, you know, fancy place. And I really want to do something for Aziza so it doesn't get forgotten. So we decided to remodel it, and we thought it was going to cost a couple hundred thousand dollars and two months. Now it's two and a half years later, and a few millions dollars later. Um, but the reason why it's not going to be called Aziza anymore, it's not going to be Aziza, is because the city made us change so many things. Because it was such an old building, there were six elevations everywhere, steps, ramps, and all of that. Uh, EDA and the new code, we could not do any of that stuff. So a lot of walls needed to move, the bar needed to move. I really felt like people, if they were to come into that building and know it as Aziza, it would never have a chance to be successful because people are going to be upset that they don't have their favorite table where it used to be and blah, 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 blah. So we decided to come up with a concept that made more sense. Um, I worked with a lot of Guatemalans when I, was, when I had Aziza. And I remember every time I would make something new, they would taste it and they would say, oh, we used to have this in Guatemala, or we used to have this in the Yucatan. I was like, you're full of shit, because this is typically Moroccan food. And, but there, was a lot of, like, there were a lot of intersections, but I never paid attention to them. Um, so finally, uh, one of my uh, sous chefs and CDCs from Aziza, he's half Mexican, and um, he worked with me for a while at Aziza, but when he came back, after he got divorced, he came back to work with me again. Um, we were talking about the concept and we like the initial idea was to make Aziza come back But it just didn't feel right. I really lost a lot of sleep over it um, and, and I decided okay what we can do is Explore that that moment in time when the Moors invaded, you know, Europe and th that happened in 7-eleven it has nothing to do with the Middle Eastern story, like the 7-Eleven stores. 7-Eleven, the year 7-Eleven, uh, the Moors invaded Europe. They were there for 800 years, so they brought with them a lot of food, a lot of art, a lot of literature, um, you know, all of that stuff stayed there for 800 years. When they were kicked out in 1492, that was the same year that the Europeans discovered um, America. And when, when America, the New World, was discovered, um, a lot of the, the, the Moors that were kicked out of the country um, and the ones that stayed in Europe, they were made into slaves that were brought to Latin America um, to work the land and, 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 and basically push away the, nati you know, the natives. Um, but this, the, the, the slaves that were you know, brought to the New World brought a lot of spices with them, a lot of technique from, from, from the Moorish culture. And I want to explore that one moment in time in 1492 when these two cultures intersected. And I just want to put like a, a little bit of light on that and see how the spices and the act of frying was foreign to Latin America. We was brought, you know. And if you think about like um, um, uh, El Pastor, Taco El Pastor, it's meat that is cooked, you know, vertically on a stick and it rotates and they slice it. That's, that's, that's a euro. I mean, I'm sorry, it's a euro. So if you take the two, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of similarities. So that's what we want to explore. I'm not, I mean, don't expect to have a couscous burrito because it's not going to happen. <laughs> uh, but we just want to explore that idea of where the two cultures intersected and, and, and put the emphasis on the spices, the technique, and, and, and the harmony in those two things. Jeff, thank you so much. Thank you. A round of applause. All right.